Hi, everybody. My name is E. David Crawford. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds and Urology. At this year's GUASCO, there were a number of interesting presentations. One was on entitled the Calipro 2 study. And this was one that was presented by Dr. Raj Agarwal, who is a professor and presidential Endowed Chair of Cancer Research at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, the University of Utah. Raj is joining me to give us the highlights of this study and the recent FDA approval and the impact and what that means to our audience. Raj, thanks for joining. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be talking to the legend. <laughs> I, I must tell you that we, after we presented the data in GUASCO in the all-comer patient population, our my study co-chair, Dr. Karim Fizazi, presented the data on HRR-positive patients only, uh, focusing on HRR-positive patient population in the ASCO 2023 meeting. And then it was a publication in the Lancet during the ASCO. So overall, uh, there were two or three publications together, which have led to FD approval, which happened last week. So. If I may, I would like to start with the design of the trial and okay. then talk about the results. Okay. This is a large phase three trial uh, where patients with newly diagnosed metastatic castor resistant prostate cancer were randomized to enzalutamide plus placebo versus enzalutamide plus talazoparib. Once daily pills for both of them, blinded radiology assessment for the radiographic progression free survival, which was the primary endpoint. And I would like to bring your attention that every patient on this trial had a prospective tumor tissue testing done to assess for the HRR mutation status. There were several other secondary endpoints which, were, which are important, such as overall survival, health-related quality of life as reported by the patients, time to delay in chemotherapy, time to delay in PSA progression, all of which, or many of which, are considered highly relevant by our patients. If you look at the results of the trial, we saw a 37% decrease in the risk of progression or death in the combination arm in all comer patient population. If you look at patient, yeah, if you look at patient population who had HRR mutations, there was a 55% reduction in risk of progression or death. Mm -hmm. So this is the primary endpoint, but Dave, tell me what else I can tell you about the trial. So, you know, just for the, the urologist listening, uh, we're, we're focusing on a group of metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer patients where enzalutamide actually has an approval. And, and this is adding on a PARP inhibitor uh, in those with uh, uh, known mutations. Um, and studied and uh, finding a significant uh, improvement in outcome. So it's really, truly uh, targeted therapy, I guess you would call it. Um, so what, what percentage of the MCRPC patients, Raj, actually uh, would fit into this uh, bucket of patients where this would be offered? Yes. So 25% patients with metastatic CRPC have HRR mutations. So this is a large patient population. I've also heard the comments that uh, every patient is receiving NHT or novel hormonal therapy like enzalutamide up front. So we do not have, or many, we may not have many patients who are eligible for treatment with enzalutamide. And we have presented the data in ASCO and based on what we have seen and what will we be publishing soon, one, only one out of three newly diagnosed MCRPC patients experience disease progression on a novel hormonal therapy before they get to this level. We also, I also want to remind our audience that many patients develop MCRPC not from metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, but from a localized prostate cancer setting where they receive surgery or radiation as definitive therapy and they have biochemical recurrence and they are treated with 
continuous or intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. And the time comes when PSA is rising in these patients. And when nowadays, when you do a PSMA PET scan, and in many patients, conventional PET, conventional scans like CT scan and bone scans, mm -hmm. you, you see metastatic disease. And right. in this patient population, I mean, you know better than any of us, you discovered you got Lupron to the clinic, androgen deprivation therapy to the clinic, that that remains the backbone of therapy for the patients with biochemical recurrence. And there is no indication yet right. for these patients to receive novel hormonal therapy. So answer is vast majority of patients, when they reach newly diagnosed MCRPC setting, they have not received or have not progressed on a novel hormonal therapy. I mean, this is this is you know, truly exciting. We're, we've got a lot of new tools in prostate cancer, not only uh, therapeutics, but also diagnostics, as you well know, with the PSMA uh, PET scans out there that are really changing the field. And, you know, I've always uh, hoped that we could turn this into a chronic disease. And we're getting there. Uh, we're getting there. So the, the last question, just for the neurologists that are that are listening in, when should we be testing for these germline somatic mutations in men with prostate cancer? Yes. So after I answer this question, I'd like to mention just two more very clinically meaningful endpoints of this trial. So answer answering your question first, every patient needs to be tested for somatic mutations and for germline testing. These are all endorsed by guidelines, whether it's NCCN guidelines or AUA guidelines or ASCO guidelines. There is no doubt when we need to identify these patients, not only to see if they can be targeted by these novel therapies, but also if they may be predisposed to have those germline mutations, unmasking this information may help their family members, their children, their brothers and sisters. So right. not testing patients is not considered appropriate anymore in my view. Raj, great presentation. Uh, what about the PSA progression in a study? Anything interesting there? It was, we saw something very interesting as far as time to PSA progression is concerned. In the enzalutamide arm, it was 11 month which is quite surprising given from the PREVAIL trial, we saw a PFS of 20 months. So that tells me that this patient population has way more aggressive disease than patients who do not have HRR mutations. Interestingly, the PSA time to PSA progression was 28 month with the combination arm. So there was a 17 month longer PS time to PSA progression in the combination arm versus the enzalutamide arm. And even beyond that, if you look at time to chemotherapy, time to deterioration and quality of life as reported by the patients and other many other secondary endpoints, they all favored the combination. The overall survival data are immature, but we are still already seeing a uh, uh, strong trend for overall survival benefit. And I'm really hoping to be talking to you about overall survival improvement with the combination in the near future. That's great. You know, uh, the seeing more than a doubling in uh, time for the PSA progression gets your attention. Um, and a lot of the studies that are out there, we look at, we're looking at three months here, four months there, and so forth. And we, we th this is a major step. For this, this is a giant step forward to see that sort of a change. Thanks for uh, sharing that information with us. And we look forward to getting back to you when the survival data gets there, Raj. Thank you very much.